Alright, y'all turn to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> we're going to just call this tonight, I said we were done, but we'll just call this the last part of sanctification. And we'll, I just want to cover a verse that really and honestly and truly kind of says it all. Okay, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. Before we start, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you and to praise your Son in the spirit that you gave us. Lord, we ask that you lead and guide us tonight through your scriptures, build us up in the unity of the faith and in love for one another. Do all these things for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul has a habit of doing this. I got to kind of studying and looking, and he seems to, to almost always do this. He starts out with a salutation, and then he'll make a statement. And in all reality, the statement, it's like he states something, and then the rest of the book he sets out to, to prove what he said. And it's almost a summary statement. Y'all look at verse 3. This sums up the book of Ephesians as good as any verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but let's just talk about this. Now, number one, I want y'all to notice. The first blessed, does that mean that you and I are uh, have to uh, give God blessings? What does it mean when we say, blessed be God? It's praise. We offer a praise. It's the same word we get our word eulogy from. You know, when you have to give a eulogy, they want you to get up and say good things, don't they? In other words, we need to say good things about God, right? So praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, right away, I want you all to notice something. If this had been prior to the cross, would he have been called that? What was he referred to in the Old Testament as? The father of who? Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. All right, I'm going to draw a timeline across here. All right. <clears throat> Was there a time then when we would have called God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? What did that imply? Is there some exclusivity in there? Is that the God of, uh, you know, uh, Charles and Chuck and, and ain't it? See, this is the God of Abraham's lineage. It's the God that appeared to Abraham and called Abraham out, isn't it? And from that point forward, who does God begin revealing Himself to? To Abraham's seed. Now, God did this in such a way that literally it takes us, we cannot unmix the two. It's so boggled up in our minds that without the leadership of the Holy Spirit, this thing just remains veiled. God used a physical nation back here, didn't He? And that physical nation was a picture of the spiritual thing that was coming. But what do we do? We, 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 we get so focused on separating the two that we miss what this really was, okay? Now, because he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what did the, the descendants of Abraham believe that that meant? They believed that because of their fleshly lineage, they were special, right? They said, that, in other words, after just a few generations, they began to think we're special because of our, our family tree, didn't they? But was God ever talking about their flesh? See, the flesh of these men was just a picture. And I want to show you all what this book of Ephesians is really getting at. Go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11. In chapter 2, verse 11, remember who the Ephesians are. The Ephesians, are, are they live in a Gentile city in what we would call Turkey today, and they're basically, for the most part, mostly Gentiles. Now, there's some Jews there, but it doesn't matter. Paul's going to explain something here in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye, these Ephesians, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Now, notice he says they were in time past Gentiles in the flesh. How come Paul ain't calling them Gentiles in the flesh over here anymore? Because they're part of the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, is there? But watch who is still calling them Gentiles. It says, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. 
What does that imply? The circumcision in the flesh made by hands? That there's a physical circumcision which leads us to say what? Then there must be another one, a spiritual, right? See, Paul had to differentiate between the two circumcisions, didn't he? Now, when a Jew called a Gentile uncircumcised, literally, what was he referring to? What, what would he really mean by that? He meant you ain't part of the covenant. You're not part of the promises, right? What was the physical token that marked Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all their descendants coming up to the cross? Circumcision. So then what confirmed the man to be part of this people? Circumcision, right? Physical circumcision, okay? So he says that the Jews, and it's unbelieving Jews, are calling the Gentiles, still calling them the circumcision. Now who's the first man that circumcised himself? Abraham. Why did God tell Abraham to circumcise himself? To gain something? A token of what he already had. Folks, this is very important that we see this. Did Abraham himself gain anything by the physical act of circumcision? All the circumcision did was show that he was already God's chosen. Folks, God chose Abraham while he was in the Ur of Chaldees. In fact, we're going to read in a minute, when did God really choose the man Abraham? Before the foundation of the world, right? So, Abraham is circumcised. All Abraham's descendants are circumcised, right? Now, God had said about these Gentiles that they were, in verse 12 here, this is what they were while Moses' law was in effect as a contract. That at that time, prior to the cross, ye, Gentiles, were without Christ. Now, why were the Gentiles without Christ? What does Christ mean? How would you say it in the Old Testament? Messiah. Well, why was the Gentiles without the Messiah? They hadn't been promised. And folks, they didn't have the Old Testament Scriptures. And where did the Jews find out about a coming Messiah? In the Scriptures. So then what advantage did Abraham's physical lineage have? They had the Word of God. The Gentiles didn't have it. So the Gentiles weren't aware of these things. They were without Christ. It says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Now that's pretty sad, isn't it? Look at the next two words. But now. Thank God for these words. But now. In Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to write Christ Jesus. And I'm going to go ahead and put in Christ Jesus. Now what do we mean when we say in what was Isaac and Jacob? In Abraham's family, weren't they? In Abraham's household. They were part of the house Abraham, weren't they? Even if they didn't live under his roof, they were still his lineage, right? But what does it mean to be in Christ? In his house. Part of his lineage. Doesn't mean you've got to be born in the tribe of Judah, does it? How did you get to be, how did one of these boys over here get to be Abraham's descendant? By natural birth. How do you get to be Christ descended? By spiritual birth. This birth back here made them the people. But this one over here makes Christ people. Okay? Now, these Gentiles that back here were outside the covenants. Why were they outside the covenants? What made Israel special back here? God chose them. This is the core of what we got. Look, God chose them. Did God choose Israel because of anything Israel had done? Matter of fact, He says the reason He chose them, didn't He? Did He choose them because they were the best? He chose them because they were the least. That doesn't mean they were the most humble and pious. doesn't mean that at all. It means of all the nations that he could have chose, he looked at the one that had the least going for them, the ones that were the least likely, the ones that were the least powerful, the ones that had the least of everything, and he picked them. He picked a, a nation of slaves, didn't he? Okay. So when God picked a, uh, Israel, did Israel pick God or had God already picked Israel? God picked them. Did Israel obey God? No. Did God 
kill them all. Well, why not? Because he picked them. He picked them. The Bible says God is faithful. Folks, you can look around the world today and are there still 100% Jewish people? Yeah, they're there. They're there. They're still there, aren't they? Y'all know me and you couldn't say that by, by just about any other, certainly none of the ancient races we could say that. We've all mixed together and as time goes on, it's all just, we're all just, it's just mixing But what have the Jews remained. A distinct, separate people. Now, uh, is God working through that nation today as, as His administers of His message? No. But do they have a future? Why do they have a future? God chose them. Folks, when God chooses something, does God ever go back on His choice? Now, currently today, because of their rebellion and their disobedience... They are like a, a child that's been put out of the house. They're like a woman that's been put out of the house. But what did God say He was going to do over here? He's going to bring them back. Is that because of anything they've ever done? When y'all read the Old Testament, do you not see just Israel's just wretchedness? It's on every page, isn't it? Can you see yourself in that? Y'all think about the choice of God. Probably this weekend, if not maybe soon, we're going to... Just really get down to it and talk about election as the Bible says. And we ain't going to beat around the bush. We're just going to see what the Bible says. But I want you all to all just consider the choice of God. Okay, there's basically two ways that we can look at this choice. And this is two ways men have looked at it. it there was only one way for about 1,600 years. And in the last 300 years come in this second way. But the first way is that God, before the foundation of the world, chose a thing, a people, a place, a thing, and then God carried out His will. It was based on grace and absolutely no merit of the individual had anything to do with it. The second way is that men say, no, the choice of God is not based just on God's choice. It's based on some foreknowledge that God had about the individual and that enabled Him to pick the individual. Now, whichever one you believe doesn't matter. I'm telling y'all, that's the two basic versions of, of election, right? I don't want you to go immediately and ask me about some tribe in, in the Amazon or some people in the Sahara Desert or anything like that. Look, let's just talk about me and you. In your experience, how, what is that chosen of? If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, in your experience, is it... That all your life you have had this burning desire to serve God. And no matter what you did, you always came back to it. And you, and you, you just by sheer willpower are going to serve God. Has that been your experience? That ain't been mine. My experience has been that I have done everything possible to run from God. That I have done everything possible to disobey Him. I have done everything to not be chosen of Him. And yet here I stand today saved. So my own personal experience tells me he didn't find anything worthy in me. I know better. So then I say, well, how in the world did you hear this message? Well, I heard it just like the other people in the Bible heard it. God opened my ears. And there's a word for the opening of the ears. It's called regeneration. All right, now, if I didn't do anything to deserve the salvation of God, how could I do anything to lose it? Folks, if I never did anything to deserve it, and the Bible says it's not any merit. Look, any merit makes it less grace, doesn't it? Alright, so if I didn't do anything to deserve it, how could I possibly do anything to now not deserve it? Think what that would suggest about God. But we don't have to get honest about what we believe about God. Now, do we believe God Almighty is all-knowing? Is He all-powerful? Is he, is he the, I mean, is he supreme above all things, including the devil? Absolutely. If he chose me today and saved me and said, okay, there's one of mine, and put me into his body only next year to have to put me out, what would that suggest he had done? He didn't know, he didn't know what I was going to do. He made a mistake. Is it possible that God saw something in me that made Him save me today, but next year learned something about me that makes Him re reject me? Folks, that ain't possible. Y'all think about me. We call that, we've got a name for that. We call that Indian giver. 
I hope no Indians get offended, but y'all know that's a, an old saying. An Indian giver means you give something and then you take it back, right? Y'all remember Lucy with the football? That's what I think about when I think about losing your salvation. Can y'all picture God there with the football snatching it away, snatching it away? How about dangling a carrot in front of you? Can you picture God Almighty doing that? What is the truth of what God did? Go back to Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Do y'all see that according as? He, you know, we kind of, there's times when we kind of oh, lose sight of, of little words that make the biggest difference. So let me show you all the word. According as, just as, even as, since, seeing that, in proportion, in the same degree, because so that He has. In other words, what it says is, how has God blessed us with all spiritual blessings? He chose us. Y'all think about this. How did He start this sentence? You believe? Oh, how did He start it? God chose you. Y'all please just, just think of this for a second. He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now how in the world are you going to claim you did something to deserve that? He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. The next argument would be, well God knows everything and He knew what I would do. When Don't you, you find me that verse. Show it to me in the scripture. Everybody says that, but where's the scripture say it? The scripture doesn't say it. No. It actually argues against being it chosen. But if, if that were the case, then that's the main grounds for not being chosen. It is, absolutely. If we had anything that merited God's choosing us, guess what we would not be? The foolish things, the base things, the despised things. Folks, God chose the foolish things. Now, if you're a believer, I'm sorry, but guess what the world says you are? A fool. Y'all know they do. Y'all walk, well, go somewhere with a Bible and how do people look at you? Look at that fool. He's still living in the 1800s in his mind. Doesn't he know about modern science and medicine? You know how they say. Okay, so then. Did God make a choice before the foundation of the world? Okay. His choice was that he was going to have a seed. Now way back here in the garden, he promised a seed, didn't he? Do we all agree with that? As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God prophesied and said, I'm going to bring the seed of the woman into the world. It's a redeemer. Now who is that seed? Christ. That's Christ. God later makes a promise to Abraham, doesn't he? He tells Abraham, Abraham, I've picked you. And he tells him all these things he's going to do. Does he ever say to Abraham, if you'll do such and such? Not a single word. He said, I am going to. I am, I am, I am. In other words, did Abraham enter into a covenant with God with his end to hold up? What did Abraham, what kind of covenant did he enter into? That's right, folks. Abraham was added on to the covenant like a rider. Like a, he's an addendum. His name is put on the covenant and the covenant is between who? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How in the world are you going to lose your salvation when your covenant is based on three that can't lie, can't change, and can't err? How are you going to lose it? How, I mean, seriously, how are you going to? You can't, can you? So when God made the promise of the seed, we come over here to Abraham's time, and God made the same statement to Abraham. He said, In thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Right? And what did Abraham's physical seed, his, his children, his lineage, think that meant? They, that's right. They thought be, be, through us, all the Gentile nations are going to be blessed. And then what became, all of a sudden, the idea of this earthly kingdom where Israel sat in charge and everybody had to go through Israel. So when Jesus Christ came, what kind of a Messiah was Israel looking for? 
He was looking for one that's run the Romans out of town, put the Jews in the position of the Romans, and let them be in charge of the world slavery. That's essentially what they were looking for. Let us run the economy. You let us have it, right? Is that what Jesus Christ came to do? Did he come to establish a physical kingdom? He came to establish an earth, a spiritual kingdom, didn't he? Now, Paul tells us, that when God told Abraham, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Who is the seed? He tells us the seed is Christ. Now, just make that, look, just, just use the words. In thy seed shall all nations be blessed. In Christ shall all nations be blessed. Have all nations been blessed in Christ? When God told Abraham all nations, what did that immediately eliminate? The idea that it's just Israel. But Israel missed that, didn't they? See, they thought they were the seed. And that's the thing that kept them so blind. Folks, it's the thing that's got such a blinded theology going on today. That is still making this distinction, right? Okay. So then all along, who was the seed that God planned to use to bless all nations? It's Christ, right? It was His plan from before the foundation of the world. Was His plan to bless one nation or all nations? Then what is He going to give this seed? Well, let's read. Ephesians 1, we'll read 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says there. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the, in the Old Covenant, to be blessed of God a lot, with these blessings, where did you have to be? In Abraham. But now where do you got to be? In Christ. So he's not called the God of Abraham, including all his descendants. He's called the God of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his descendants. It says, who? Now who does who refer to? God the Father, who hath blessed us. What tense is that? Now wait a minute. Does it, does it say half blessed because it's just referring to these Ephesians that were already saved? Or is it referring to all saved people? How did God already bless us with all spiritual blessings? He put us in Christ. What did He say He was going to do before the foundation of the world? He's going to bless a group of people with everything in Christ. And guess what? That's a done deal. Folks, as soon as God said it back here, what's going to happen? It's going to happen, isn't it? Y'all remember what it says in Numbers? God is not a man that he should repent, neither should he lie. Hath he not said it, and shall he not do it? Do y'all remember what Solomon said about the earthly promises he had made the nation Israel when they dedicated the temple? Solomon stood up in front of it and said, Not one single word of God's promises hath failed to come to pass. Did Israel deserve it? Folks, they did everything not to deserve it, didn't they? So because he blessed that group of people who did nothing to deserve the blessing, what trait of God was magnified to all people? His grace and mercy. What did he say he came to do? To make himself known. His goodness, his grace, and his mercy. So now, we've got this thing here where God has done this. Now notice also it says, God, the Father, who hath blessed us? Did you do anything to bless yourself? Did you have these blessings before you believed? Did these blessings enable you to believe? Or did you believe and go out and attain these blessings? They were given you before the foundation of the world. So he says, with all spiritual blessings. Now people will say, now wait a minute. Abraham's blessings were all physical. No. All Abraham's blessings had physical examples to represent them, didn't they? For instance, what was the physical representation of heaven itself when God spoke to Abraham? The promised land. Did God bring Abraham into the promised land? How much of the promised land did Abraham build a mansion on? None of it. What did it say? He looked beyond it. What did Abraham look for? A city whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a heavenly city, didn't he? So then even though he couldn't see all the details, what did Abraham represent? What did he understand? That the earthly things were only what? Temporary. 
They're representations, aren't they? What's going to happen to everything earthly over here at the second coming? It's going to melt with fervent heat. If God blessed us with all physical blessings in earthly places, that ain't much of a blessing. And yet about 80 and 90 years ago, he, I, I was studying and researching and it looks to me like the depression really got this going. When the depression was over, the people had been through hard times and they did not want to go back to them. And preachers saw that. So what did preachers latch on to and start preaching? Health, wealth and prosperity on this earth. And you listen to them today. I, I, me and Lexi went, had to get a ride from a guy. We had to get some work done on a car. Had to get a ride from a guy. And he told me he loved listening to Joel Olstein on the radio. And I said, well, I said, he's a great motivational speaker. He said, oh, he can find the good in everything. Ain't that what he said, Lexi? I said, you know what's a shame is I never hear him preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never hear, hear him preach Christ's sacrifice for my sins. He said, oh, yeah, he does. I said, well, I've never heard it. And then he immediately wanted to change the subject. What does he really preach? And I'm not picking on him. I'm just showing you what happened. What does he preach to his congregation? What does God want you to be? Healthy, wealthy, and wise. What did Jesus Christ promise the believer? Tribulation, pain, suffering, and anguish. Now y'all think about that as night and day. Why are people preaching this earthly... Look, if God's blessings are a new car, that ain't much of a blessing. How long does a new car last? Till the end. I mean, is it going to make it through the, the coming of the Lord at the, at the fervent heat? Now, am I saying that I don't thank God? Look, I do. I thank God that I've got transportation that gets me around. I thank Him for it. But do you think that's the end game of God? To get me a car? To get you a house? To get you good health? How, how about there's people that say that the Scriptures teach that healing of your physical body is in the atonement. That's the biggest lie. It ain't the word in the scripture that says that. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul, was he in the atonement? He cried out for healing and what did the Lord tell him? My grace is sufficient for you. Why did he say that? Paul told us. Because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, what did God pick to form this body mainly of? The weak, despicable, foolish things. No offense to y'all, but look around here. Do we look like the pillars of Mobile? Anybody running for mayor? To... No. We're, we're, look, this is what the church has consisted of. Do you realize what the church was made up of in the first century? Mostly a bunch of slaves, wasn't it? A bunch of Roman slaves. I mean, look who, I mean, you look at the people that believe. Now, whenever God says to Abraham that he's going to make a nation out of him, Yes, there was an earthly nation that was only a representation. But what nation was God really talking about? The body of Christ. A spiritual nation. Okay? Now, how did I get to be a confirmed member of this nation back here? What did I have to do? I had to be born into it and circumcised. Didn't I? Now remember, what came first, the birth or the circumcision? Now you think about it for a minute. What comes first? How do I get into this spiritual nation? Over here, I had to have a physical birth, right? And a physical circumcision. Well, how do I get into this spiritual nation? i got to have a spiritual birth and a spiritual circumcision. So then what were actual circumcision? What was it only? It's a type. It's an example. It's a pattern. It pictured something. But without getting graphic, when God had Abraham circumcise himself, he cut away a piece of flesh, didn't he? What did he do with it? He threw it away. What was it good for? Nothing. Moses' wife threw it at him. True, yeah. Moses' wife got mad, huh? God come to kill him but think about all that was in detailed in that. Had he just told him he was going to give him that child he promised him. And then what did he tell him to do? Cut on the very thing that you would use to produce a child. 
He had just tried to produce the child with Hagar and 13 years of misery ensued. And God said, no, I'm going to do it. Prove that you believe I'm going to do it. Cut yourself. Now, I'm not saying God was in cut. God was showing us something. What did he do when he circumcised himself? Literally, he was giving up on that flesh doing it, wasn't he? He was acknowledging that I can't do it. And he cooked the flesh and flung it away, didn't he? Go to Philippians chapter 3. Next book to the right. I want to show you all the spiritual circumcision of Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. Alright, in chapter 3, Paul's warning the people about the, the Jews, and he calls them the concision. Look in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Y'all know what that means? It's a botched or a mutilated circumcision. What had the Jews done with the token of circumcision? They had perverted it into believing it did something. Hey, this shouldn't surprise us. What have so many people done with water baptism? Turned it into something they believe saves them, haven't they? They turned what, what they say turned started out as a token. They turned it into something they believe saves them. But watch what he says in the next verse. For, why should you beware of the concision, the, the physical Jews? For, because... We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, there are men that will try to prove that all the Philippians were Jews and Paul speaking to a bunch of Jews. Folks, that's crazy. Why would I need to do that? In the body of Christ, is there Jew or Gentile? Is there a spiritual circumcision made without hands, the scripture says? Paul already referred to the one made with hands, didn't he? So here I've got the circumcision made with hands, and over here I've got the circumcision made without hands, don't I? Now watch what he says next. You want to see Paul's spiritual circumcision? Here it is. What did he just say he had? No confidence in the flesh. Picture a circumcision, cutting that and slinging it away, right? Watch Paul sling it away. Verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. If there had ever been a man that could stand behind this physical circumcision and say, I'm really something, who would it have been? Paul, folks, this was the cream of the crop, wasn't he? But watch him cut it away here, verse 7. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You mean the apostle lost all things? Does that sound like health, wealth, and prosperity? The man that's sick needs a doctor his entire life. The man that gets stoned, shipwrecked three times, beat with rods. Does that sound like prosperity to y'all? Look at the next verse, what he had though. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Now, if when I was placed in Christ, God gave me a righteousness, and then committed unto me the responsibility to keep that righteousness untainted, how long could you do it? You couldn't do it for a second. The first thing you'd want to do is boast about the righteousness you had. Well, if it's Christ's righteousness given to you, who's the only one that can take it? Christ. Now, wait a minute. What does righteousness actually mean? It's perfection, folks. It's godly perfection. What did God's Son put to your account to, to, if you're in Christ? For His perfection. Will He ever take it? Then how in the world could you ever suffer the loss of it? So He says, Be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, or by my religious works, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now do you all see the circumcision in that? You see Paul depending on his flesh before he was saved? And then what happened? He cut it away. Folks, the man had been circumcised by the operation of God. 
What had God shown him? Your flesh can't do it. Your flesh cannot produce the fruit I'm looking for. What did God show Abraham? Your flesh cannot produce the fruit I'm looking for. What did He show Paul? You cannot gain the promises of God by your own efforts. What did He show Abraham? You cannot gain the promised child by your own efforts. Who's got to do it? God. Now, in the big context, flip back over again to Ephesians 1. Now, I just want to show y'all what God's plan was, because this truly is, it's, hey, look, in Ephesians, what we really have in Ephesians chapter 1 is the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible. Paul didn't come up with this. The Holy Spirit used him to write it. The Holy Spirit has taken me and you back before time. He's taken us back before there was a creation. We're reading the oldest thing in the Bible right here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according, or just as, even as, He hath chosen us in Him. How did He bless us? First, He chose us. In Him, before the foundation of the world. Who are we talking about did this? God the Father. I'm going to write that up here. We've got God the Father. So then who planned all of this? God the Father. He planned it. And I'm going to say He willed it. In other words, He desired it. Does God get the things He desires? He is. You've got to believe He does. So it says, having, look how He did this, that we should, or let me back, before the foundation of the world, that, or so that, we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. What did God determine that these people were going to be? Believers? Holy and without blame. Did God decide that's what was going to happen before the foundation of the world? Yes. How did God ensure that the believer could stand before Him that way? He sent His Son to die in your place. He sent His Son down here, literally, to get a wife. His Son came down here and got a wife. And how does God look at the wife? Just as perfect as the Son. Based on the wife's performance? Why? Because she's the one the Father chose. The Father chose the bride. Alright, now, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. You know, in Romans 9, it tells us the spiritual blessings that were given to Israel. Now, there were physical representations of them, but the spiritual blessings were given to them and the remnant of believing Israel got them. Paul's one of them. What's the very first one? He said... To them people pertaineth the adoption. Did God adopt some Jews into His body, the church, the body of Christ? Okay. Back here at first, what is the church, the body of Christ, made up of exclusively for the first about three and a half years? Jews. Now look, I'm going to put Jews, and what are all of them that are in the church? Believers. Right? Where did God take these Jewish believers? He took them right out of unbelieving Israel, didn't He? He took them in there. Their physical circumcision didn't amount to a hill of beans. Paul said it meant nothing. What made this group of Jews special? God chose them, right? Okay, now he says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. You know another way I could say that? He did it even as, just as, or according as He desired to do it. Now, because you and I can't understand election. And look, I'm telling you as a human being, we can't. We look into it, and because we can't understand it, we write it off as being wrong. You talk about arrogant and foolish. Does the Bible not tell me God's ways are way beyond my ways? Yeah. You know what the very Bible says about election? It's a thing too high for me and you to understand. We don't have to understand it. We don't have to spend any time digging into it. We really don't. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul warned us not to. 
the writings of Paul said don't. He said, well, who are you to talk about these things? So now, he says, verse 6, He did all this to the praise of the glory of His grace. Now, what does grace mean? So was the entire plan going to magnify the grace of God? What would any merit on your part do to it? Detract from the grace of God. So it says, wherein, because it was going to be according to His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Did you do anything to make yourself acceptable? Who did it? Now what did God do before the foundation of the world? We, they had a plan. We had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world. And the Father's part was He willed it. He said it's going to be, didn't He? As soon as He said back here, this is what's going to happen, what was going to happen? That all creation had not even existed. No heaven and no earth when He does this. As a matter of fact, hold, hold your hand there. Go back to Psalm uh, 89. It won't spend long here. I just want to show y'all. When y'all get a chance, y'all read Psalm 89. This is, people call it a messianic psalm, and it's certainly about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's several things here is quoted in the New Testament. But watch what it says, uh, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. What are, what's this saying he's going to make known about God? His faithfulness. His faithfulness. What's that mean? Folks, if God said he's going to do a thing, is he? If God committed to something, is he going to decommit? Alright, verse 2. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall I establish in the very heavens. What did God say was going to be built up? Mercy. mercy. Next verse. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Now you'd say this covenant was with David. Folks, the covenant with David was only a type or a picture. Who's David a type of? Christ. It says, Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Is there any way you could say that of physical David? But can you say it of Christ? Was this the plan? The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. You mean he already is talking about having a congregation of people that are going to praise God's mercy and faithfulness? What's Ephesians chapter 1 talking about? That God predestinated his son to have a group of people to do this very thing. He says, for who in the heaven can be, can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. Huh? The assembly of the saints. Y'all see what he's talking about here? He, he goes on talking. There's a whole bunch. Of, again, y'all read it when you get a chance. It's a great thing. But look what he says in verse uh, 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Who's that talking about? Christ. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Did God the Father and God the Son have a covenant? What covenant did God explain, begin explaining to Abraham? The everlasting covenant. Is that got anything to do with Moses' covenant? No. Moses' covenant is added later, folks, as a tool of teaching, an instrument. And the thing that was added to, to teach something is the very thing Israel twisted and turned. It's the very tool that they used. Like always, they turned the Scripture around and made it about themselves, didn't it? Who was the law really teaching about? Christ. He looked, y'all make sure that we all get this. The law of Moses, along with all the Old Testament Scriptures is nothing more than the preaching of the gospel of Christ in pictures and signs and symbols and men and, and events. That's all it is. Now, when God said He was going to bless all nations in the seed of Abraham, did He mean all nations? So at first, what are all the people in the church, the body of Christ, the first three and a half years? They're Jews. 
But does their circumcision mean anything? Paul said it means nothing. What circumcision does mean something? The spiritual one, right? Well, what begins to happen after the three and a half years? The Gentiles begin to come in. And what did the believing Jews say? This can't be. This can't be. See, they thought they understood the Old Testament, didn't they? And then what happened? God began to show to Peter it can be. Not only can it be, it's going to be. It is. Right? So flip back over to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read verse 11 again. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, so I'm going to go ahead and write them up here. I'm going to get me another group up here. And I'm just going to write them over here. And I'm going to put Gentile believers. This is so important. All right, where does the world go so wrong on the Jew and Gentile thing? They make it all Jews all Gentiles, don't they? Was God ever promising anything to all Jews back here or was it always to the true believing Jews? Remember what Elijah said in his day? I'm the last one left. And God said, no, all Israel's not Israel. There's 7,000 that are really Israel. Those are the ones I'm dealing with. There, in other words, it was the nation inside of the nation, wasn't it? Okay, what was Israel a type of over here? The whole affair was a type of what? The church over here. What do we have in the world today? We got a massive, visible, professing church, don't we? Look, there's over a billion people right now that worship the system of Rome, aren't there? There's probably another billion that claim other factions or whatever. And I'm not saying they're all, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, when Jesus Christ came the first time, was the entire nation His? Or was there just some that God had given him? And what did Jesus Christ say he would have to do? He said he came to seek and to save those the Father had gave him. Did he? Did he miss a single one? Come over here to the second coming. When the Lord comes back, will he immediately sit down and begin to reign over all the righteous? Nope. What's he got to do? He's got to call out the real from the false. In other words, he's got to call out the true church from among the professing church. Just like you had the Israel and within them a true Israel, right? Now, let's move on. Verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. What does both mean? Believing Jew, believing Gentile, both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What does a partition do? It divides. It separates, right? What was it that was in the world that separated the Jew and the Gentile? The law. The law. Now, is it just thou shalt not kill, thou shalt... No, watch what he says. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity... So the enmity is what was causing the division, isn't it? Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. What ordinance do y'all think of first? Making the division. Well, baptism today. Circumcision then, wasn't it? In other words, did the law of Moses say if a man wasn't circumcised, he was not to come within the camp? It did, didn't it? Does that matter today? It says, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself, that's in Christ, of twain one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh, for through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. So then what do the believing Jew and the believing Gentile have in common today? Everything. What do they have? Nothing. Folks, there is no difference. There's no distinction. 
Over and over we're told there's not a difference between a Jew and a Gentile believer. Is there a difference between a male and a female believer? How about a bond and a free? Is there any difference? You know what you ladies are called? What did he say? A lady that's saved has the opportunity to become a son of God. Huh? Why aren't they called daughters of God? Sons. We're going to be like Christ, aren't we? Sons of God. Okay. This body starts out mostly Jewish. Has there always been a sprinkling of Jews since they kind of fell away back there? Look like by the time Paul wrote, write, writes Romans, it looks like the Jews had for the most part been just tossed away and gone. You couldn't ever convince them there would ever be a Jewish revival, could you? But you know what? You couldn't have convinced them the Gentiles would believe back here, could you? But what's the church made up mostly for seven or 1,800 years here? Gentiles. But what did Paul say you can expect before the second coming of the Lord? The biggest revival in history is coming, folks. What's going to happen? Folks, the Jews are coming back. Not the Jews are coming back into the land to rule over the earth like the United Nations says. It says they were cut off of the olive tree. But what's going to happen to them? They're going to be grafted in. It says if the cutting off of them was wonderful for the Gentiles, and it was, doesn't it? It said, how much more so shall be their grafting in? Folks, there's coming in the future. People don't like talking about this, but there's coming a time in the future when Jews in mass, it's going to look like as a nation, are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will the effect be on the Gentiles? It'll be good. Hey, this is what Romans 11 is talking about. And to, to separate this thing into political, it's just crazy. It won't work. It's all the same tree. Now, Next verse, 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Is there any doubt about the fact that God Almighty had a plan? Did He carry out His plan to perfection? What was His plan before the foundation of the world? He's going to... That's right, folks. This was His plan. His plan was that... Look, if we go back... Let's just do it this way. God the Father planned and willed something, didn't He? What did He will? That all honor and glory would go to who? His Son. His son. So let's put God the Son. Right? God the Son. Well, the Father willed it to be done for the love of the Son, didn't He? Now go back to Ephesians. We're going to see all three parts of the Godhead working in this. Uh, it, look, in, cha in chapter 1, in verse 3 down through verse 6, we've got what the Father did. Don't we? We all agree. He planned it, appointed it, made it to be. He chose, right? But watch verse 7. Here's what the Son did. Look, it says, in whom. Now this is referring to Christ because the last thing in the chapter, uh, verse 6, is accepted in the beloved. That's Christ. In whom. In Christ, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Are your sins forgiven in Christ? How could your sins get you out of Christ? Folks, God determined before the foundation of the world that He was going to take your sins and cast them away, didn't He? So next verse. Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Again, this is what the Son did. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. Now, let's back up a second here. The Father planned it. What did the Son do? He carried it out. In other words, the Father willed it. The Son supplied everything. He did it, didn't he? but we still got the Holy Spirit, don't we? Now watch the Holy Spirit's part in the covenant come in here. Verse 11. 
in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Who is it that's in charge of this gospel going forth today? The Holy Spirit. How about the Word? The Holy Spirit. Watch Him here. In whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Do you know why we believers need earnest until the redemption? Because we ain't going to be perfected. We're in the flesh. We're going to fail. We're going to falter. So what do we need? We need a guarantee. And God stooped so low as to give us one. As if it was not enough that God said so and we just trust His, His Word. God stooped so much as to give us an indicator because God knows exactly what we are. So then the Father planned it. The Son carried it out. And the Holy Spirit applies it. Y'all remember in the beginning, Genesis? It's all the same thing. Alright, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, didn't it? And then there, we got the, a mess. We, we got a situation where things need regenerating, don't they? And the very first thing we see is the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Before He said, let there be light, what was already happening? The Spirit was moving upon the face of the waters. When He moved on the face of the waters, what was under the water and around there? Dirt and clay and minerals, wasn't He? Who was made of the dirt and water? We are. How does God regenerate a lost sinner? The Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. And what's the first thing God says? Let there be light. There's regeneration. God did not come down, the Holy Spirit did not come down and search through the waters for that which was still good. He did not sift through the waters for that which was still pure. He didn't even purify the waters. He came down and moved upon them. In other words, He moved the waters and forced the waters into a position where dry land had to appear. Now you think about the conviction of sin. You want to tell me that chosen of God is chosen because of something God saw in you? It ain't nowhere else in the Bible. Folks, I cannot stand here today and tell you in any shape, form, or fashion that I could prove election is based on my faith by my life. My life says just the opposite. I have done everything possible to make God not select me, and yet I could not get away from the selection of God. God chose a thing and it's going to happen. Now, as my granny used to say, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way, but it's going to get done, isn't it? Thank God we serve a, a, a almighty God that is, knows all things and makes no mistakes. Did God ever choose a single one that He rejects? The only one you could even come close to saying would be Judas. But, thank God, we got Old Testament Scripture to say God chose him even for that, didn't He? Did God know what He was going to do? And Jesus said He was a devil, and even though He picked Him, didn't He? See, God makes all things to work according to His will. Now, we're going to spend some classes talking about this in the future, but for the time being, we're going to finish up, and I'm still going to call this class sanctification, because what is this entire process? Sanctification. God's choice God's carrying it out and making it holy. God's putting it in a position over here. And it's, it's like you can take this whole thing and you can just bring it down to a microcosm as small as one of us individuals. You can expand it out. As, it doesn't matter. It's the same process over and over and over. Alright, any questions? Okay, thank you all very much.